Okay, we're live. Hi everyone, we are Sunflowers and Red Feathers. I'm Christina. And I'm Stephanie. We are two moms living in the before and after of child loss. Join us in this journey as we share our stories of not only loss, but how life after loss can still be full of beauty, love, hope, and joy. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on when we post a new video. Bye. Bye. Hey there. Welcome to another episode of Sunflowers and Red Feathers. I'm Stephanie. Hi, and I'm Christina. Today in this episode, we are going to be getting a little personal again. Um, this episode, we are going to go into our stories. So we're going to tell you a little bit about Mason, a little bit about Joshua, and uh, a little bit about the story of the days that they died, which is something that we haven't done yet on our podcast. We kind of told you that they did, obviously, and that's one of the reasons why we, well, <laughs> the only reason why we came to be uh, friends, how I met Stephanie. And um, I'm just going to start by reading something that I wrote a little while ago, just so I can make sure I say everything how I want to say it. So um, there are many similarities in our grief stories and the ways that our children died. That's the reason that Stephanie and I have bonded. We now have the same fear, the same anxiety, water, drowning, and especially seeing children near swiftly moving water. It's a trigger for us because of our trauma. We aren't talking about triggers in this episode though. We want to talk about how the places in which our trauma happened were and are beautiful places. They were our happy places. How can something so beautiful, the great outdoors, water, God's wonderful works of art, bring so much pain and so much anxiety now? Will that ever change? Yeah. So hard topic for us tonight. Um, I don't know that we've been purposely trying to avoid it, but it does bring up a lot of emotions and that's something that's hard to do. Um, I don't think either one of us have really um, shared um, in depth our stories in a long time because I mean let's face it it's one of those taboo topics we don't talk about very often um mm -hmm. obviously we both know each other's story inside and out um, and we can talk comfortably about them um but sharing them with other people and being vulnerable and opening our hearts and talking about those days is hard <laughs> so bear with us as we do this because it might get a little emotional. <laughs> I already am emotional thinking about it because I haven't talked about it in a long time. Um, but uh, Jared and I, my husband, we are very outdoorsy people. Um, we have our happy place out in the mountains and um, that's just something that has always been us since, I mean, it's been that way for me since I was a little kid. And um, it's been one of the things that we do in our marriage, whenever we're stressed, we go to the mountains, we retreat. That's what we do. And the day that we lost Joshua was one of those days. <laughs> um, it was a Sunday and my husband is a CPA. And so we were in the middle of, it was in March. So the middle of um, tax season and the only day he ever had off was Sunday. And that was a stressful week for us and um, church wasn't meeting as normally. We were having what we call stake conference. And so our congregation wasn't meeting as normal. And we decided, you know, let's just get out of town for the day. Let's go go to the mountains, get some fresh air and just play for a little bit as a family. And that's something that we love to do. You know, we're gonna be in the car. The kids are gonna be in the car. We're all gonna be contained. <laughs> Be stress free. I don't know. That's something we do. I'm all about putting the kids in the car seat and just whew, taking a breather. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, that's what our plan was. I remember almost everything about that day. Um, I remember waking up in the morning and um, us talking about not going to church. We were just going to, you know, we dressed down. We were getting ready to get in the car. Joshua was in his pajama pants and. <laughs> his favorite maroon shirt. He did not match at all. He was wearing super Mario red pajama pants and then this beautiful button up maroon shirt. He dressed <laughs> weird that day. Crazy kid. 
Um, but he was jumping on my bed that morning. I remember him jumping on my bed and he was like, I'm crazy about Super Mario. And I was snappy with him and told him to stop jumping on my bed. And he was like, but you let me do it yesterday. And I got on to him and he said, Nestor, Nest, if I can talk, woo, yesterday instead of yesterday. And I don't know why I remember that, but I, I remember being like, ah, stop saying yesterday, it's yesterday. <laughs> uh, silly kid. Anyway, he looked like a complete goofball and it was great. And he was wearing sandals for some reason. Sandals. No, summer. <laughs> so, no, it wasn't. <laughs> what it was, was that? Right. I say, oh, it was summer, but it wasn't. No, 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 it was March. <laughs> it was a beautiful day, though. It was beautiful. Um, well, it was beautiful in the mountains. <laughs> it was yeah. that, that year was Snowmageddon, or yeah, Snowmageddon mm -hmm. 2017, crazy snow yeah. in the valley. Yeah, crazy. Um, and so anyway, our stress took us up out in the mountains. And I remember driving down this long road and we finally got to the trees and I rolled down the windows and the pine trees, oh, the smell was just amazing and I remember thinking oh this is the best and I, I remember commenting oh this is so beautiful and we were talking about um Rome because <laughs> Joshua loved Rome so Jared was giving a history lesson in the car as we were driving up and I remember Joshua at one point was all like hey we need to pray and we were like okay I mean this wasn't a super uncommon occurrence our kid loved to pray he loved talking to God so um it seemed fitting. I remember uh, Jared took off his hat and everybody took off their hat and Josh decided to pray while Jared was driving. And I remember he, <laughs> he prayed that um, I would have 40,000 children, which was crazy. <laughs> um, they were all supposed to be men and they were all coming from me. I remember that specifically. And I was like, okay, that's not going to happen. Wow. Cool. Um, <laughs> and I remember him praying specifically that we would be safe as a family. And that's something that hits me so much still he prayed that we'd be safe um but that was an unanswered prayer that day <laughs> I mean we were as a family I guess the rest of us were safe but Joshua wasn't that day <laughs> um anyway we got to a point and everybody had to go potty of course we had three little kids everybody needs to go potty why not right and so we pulled off at a trailhead um and we got out and the boys all went potty and Jared was like, Hey, do you want to explore a little bit? Cause I mean, we're at a trailhead, so why not? And it, it, the road and the trailhead, um, it was along a river and it was beautiful. It was so pretty. Um, and that was just like our ideal place. Like the trailhead was gorgeous. It was all trees and the river was, you could hear the water running and it was beautiful. And anyway, um, the boys all got out and, they went to the bathroom and I had my baby at the time. He was 16 months old. I had him on my hip, but I didn't have shoes on him. And so, um, I went back to the vehicle and my husband was, you know, playing with the boys and, um, I went back to the vehicle and was getting shoes on the baby. And, um, all of a sudden I heard Jared say, Hey, Josh, where are you? And, he wasn't there. <laughs> and I remember putting my baby down in the car. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. I put him down in the car and I started yelling his name and I couldn't see him. And Jared was running up and down the riverbank uh, frantically. My husband can't swim. He's terrified of water. <laughs> and ironic. Um, and so I made sure that Jared had Ian, my three-year-old at the time, and I jumped in the water and um what it usually is just a really shallow area because of but because of the snowfall and the water runoffs it was um really swollen and really fast and I jumped in and I was holding on to a tree branch and the water was up to my shoulders and I could barely hold on and I kept thinking my husband kept saying let go 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 you have to get him and I couldn't let go. I kept thinking, if I let go, I'm not going to get out of this water. And it was excruciating. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs, wanting so badly to let go of that tree to get to my baby. But I knew that I couldn't do that. And that was probably the hardest thing. That's the thing that I 
I still have nightmares about that screaming. I can't explain what that scream is. But if you're a mom that has lost a child, you know exactly what that scream is. It's one that comes from the depths of your soul and, and it's hard and it hurts and it's painful and you feel all of that at once. Um, sorry. That's okay. But eventually I had to get out of the water. I was cold and I laid on the river, on the bank and just wept and screamed and pled that he was somehow saved. Um, but I knew he was gone and we didn't have any cell reception. So I ended up having to put the boys in the, in the truck while my husband ran along down farther in the bank. And I had to drive probably 10 miles until I saw another person and I waved them down and they pulled over and I asked them if they had cell reception and they didn't have cell reception either. And so the woman in that vehicle ended up getting into my vehicle and she drove me back to the trailhead while her husband drove another 20, 25 miles to call um, emergency services. And it took them four hours. Um, they brought helicopters in and um, it took them four hours to retrieve his body. He was only... 400 yards away from where he entered and he was tangled up in willow branches and his little body was it was pretty beat up and they didn't let us see him and that was really hard um but we got to see him the next day in the funeral home i think that day it was crazy because you know, you leave your home with your beautiful babies and you drive home with an empty car seat. It's the hardest thing. <laughs> but, sorry, now I'll get into how <laughs> um, we've found that, you know, those beautiful places that we once loved, they might not be as beautiful, but they're still healing in a way. Um, we're still an outdoorsy family. We still go hiking. Um, we avoid water <laughs> at all costs now. I, we, that's just not what we can do yet in our family. And that's okay. <laughs> um, but we still um, find peace and solace in the wilderness, um, in the mountains. I still, I was driving the other day and we were getting away because we needed a weekend uh, with six kids under seven. We need <laughs> a break sometimes and nature is our break. And I was thinking, man, I used to think this would, this is it. This was, you no know, perfect. This, the trees and everything, the smell. And now every time I'm there, all those memories come back. It still smells good, but there's that in the back of my mind. It smelled good that day too, you know? Yeah. But there's something about being in nature that is so healing. And there's still that, that beauty aspect that's still there. Um, but it hurts. And that's something that, you know, I'm going to live with for the rest of my life. And that's just the truth of it. Yep. I understand. I know. <laughs> <sighs> Is it my turn? Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna let you talk about Mason now. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Well, so Mason was 19 months old. Um, so my parents, when I was in my 19 or 20s, early 20s, bought a house. And um, I remember when we found this house, like we were driving up and down. If you're from Idaho, it's off of you stick, it's farmland. It felt like the boonies totally out in the middle of nowhere. And for some reason we had driven past it a couple of times, my mom and I, and um, they weren't looking for a house. Um, I didn't even live with my parents at the time. And um, anyway, saw this house, the yard was dead. It looked 
horrible. It was obviously empty, abandoned, but my mom and I saw it for the beauty that we knew it could be. And it was this huge three story, had a huge backyard, though it was dead. Um, there's a beautiful creek behind it, farmland on all sides. And we're like, this would make a beautiful home. And so we, <laughs> I'm not the biggest person in the world. So I fit through the dog door, broke into the house, let my parents in. <laughs> And we all just like walked around the house and got our own self guided tour. And long story short, my parents ended up buying the house. They already owned a house. It was like their second home. And so they ended up um, moved in for some reason or another. I ended up moving in. So anyways, I did live there at some point with my parents and um, it was this beautiful home. And there was an empty lot next door, an extra lot. And one of the things that my mom and I jokingly talked about when we first, when she bought the house, was like, hey, we could build a house next door and like live next door to you. Well, fast forward a few years and that actually happened. So my parents decided to build out the lot next door and build just a single story, 1500 square foot home, three bedrooms, you know, just enough that they would um, be comfortable on one story, like as a retirement home. And our plan was that my husband and I, who just gotten pregnant with Mason, um, would live in the house. And then as my family grew and as my parents got to retirement age, uh, we would switch houses. And so it was like this beautiful grand plan and um, it came to happen. We built the house, we moved in about, uh, it was actually the week before Mason turned one, we moved into the house and it was brand new, beautiful. And, um, we even, we watched it being built, you know, from next door at my parents' house. When the studs got put up, our whole church came over and we gave everybody Sharpies and they wrote Bible verses and happy sayings. Our friends, everybody came over. Literally the walls in that house have beautiful words written all over it. And even the bedroom that was for Mason had, you know, Dr. Seuss and happy sayings, all sorts of things on it. So the house was literally built it was our forever home like it was built for for mason it was his home and so um i'm reading through my notes here um so anyways the creek behind the house was always like a happy place for me um even before we built our home home there if i was visiting or we had friends over like we'd have campfires down there it was just so peaceful especially at night there was these there's these beautiful willow trees that line the creek and, you know, they kind of fall down around you and I mean, they're not willows. I don't know, olive something, but they're, they really felt enclosed. Oh, the Russian olive trees. Yeah. The Russian olive trees. And so you really feel like you're enclosed in this little spot and then you can hear the water running and especially at night, it was just gorgeous. And then you just have farmland all in the backdrop. And I just, I would go out there if I ever needed to just be alone or have my thoughts. And um, when I found out that I was pregnant with Noah, I got Mason this little onesie that said, can you dig it? I'm going to be a big brother. And I took him down to the side of the creek and gave him this little shovel. And he was like digging in the dirt because his shirt said, can you dig it? And I got this cute little this little photo shoot with him with this little shovel and his little tractor shirt. And it was gorgeous. And um, those pictures were taken two weeks before he died. Um, so one of the things that I think about now, which Stephanie kind of mentioned is, well, just, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit more. So the day that he died, um, I was working full time. So my, he was at daycare with my mom. My mom had an in-home daycare and they went to, um, a beach that day and he played in the water and, um, spent the whole day playing in the water. And we had just realized that he really enjoyed that because that whole weekend before we went up to a lake and played in the water all weekend. So literally all these things, he just, he got introduced to water and he loved it and he was drawn to it. And so the night that he died, it was a Tuesday and I had, um, we had moved next door already, obviously. So we were having like a little girl's jewelry party. So all my girlfriends and my mom, my sister was over and, you know, we were having like a girl's thing. And so I kicked uh, my husband and Mason out of the house. I'm like, go shoo, shoo, shoo. You know, like we're having a girl night. And so my father and my brother-in-law and my husband and Mason were all next door at my parents' house. And we did our girl thing. And, you know, it was my last 
memories of like saying goodbye to him. We're like kicking him out of the house, you know? Um, so we did our stuff and I just remember both of our, my house and my parents' house, like the back doors opened up to the beautiful backyards and you can see the creek behind it. And I remember seeing my husband walking kind of like along the creek in the back back yard because we had a fenced in yard and then there was like land between that and the creek that was just open and um he was like walking back there and I just kind of the back of my mind was like well that's kind of odd and like you know where's Mason where's my dad where's my brother-in-law and you know whatever they're probably just playing with a goat and so didn't think anything of it and I was probably about towards the end of the party so almost eight-ish so the party ended about eight and you know people started to head next door and we were to see where the guys were and um, everybody just started calling to try to figure out where everybody had went because nobody was home. And we noticed that like a car was gone. Um, it was just weird. We're like, well, maybe they went to go get ice cream or, you know, how the guys are. And I don't know. It's just like my mom's first instinct was to like freak out and panic. And I'm like, mom, chill. Like everything's fine. So we're calling everybody. Nobody's answering. Cars are gone. Finally, like, I'm like, okay, this is strange. So my friend and uh, my sister got in the car to go to the hospital to see if maybe somebody, you know, got hurt. Maybe they're working with tools. Somebody cut their finger. I don't know. Um, and then I got in the car with my close friend, Jennifer, who was the jewelry lady. She did the party for us. And um, we started driving down the road and I saw my uh, brother-in-law's car on the side of the road. And so we pulled over and... Like, I just remember looking at him and he's, he's a man of few words as is, but I just remember looking at his face and he just had this look of like blank. Like he had no words, like he couldn't say anything. And instantly I knew, I don't know what about it, but just where he was and the fact that nobody was saying anything and I saw the gate to the backyard open. And I remember thinking, well, that's not, that's not a good idea. You know, if Mason had been in the backyard, he could get out. And as soon as I saw my brother-in-law and I saw his face and the fact that everybody was gone and I hadn't seen Mason anywhere and nobody had a car seat. So obviously he didn't go with anybody anywhere. I, I don't know, I'll call it mother's intuition, but I knew he was gone. I knew he had gone to the creek. So, um, the police were called and my husband was missing. I had no idea where he was. My brother-in-law, my dad didn't know either. They finally both showed back up at the house and um, the police came and everybody was trying to figure out where everybody was, where my husband went. And I'm like, he jumped in the creek. I know he did, but nobody said that. And so anyway, the cops stayed at our house until about midnight that night. He was a missing person and news stories were all over Facebook and looking for this 19 month old boy that was missing and keep your eye open. And there's people all over in the farmland with flashlights up and down the cornfield, like trying to find him, calling his name out. We slept with all the lights on in the house, the back porch lights on. I don't, well, I say slept, but nobody really slept. And then the police were like, we'll come back at 6 a.m. and we'll start looking again. So same thing happened the next morning. We got up and everybody started searching the cornfields and looking everywhere. And they even had dogs. And one of the things that always stands out in my mind, and I still hate the sound of it, is helicopters. Because you you said that with Joshua. They had a, a dive team that was going up and down the creek. And um, they didn't have any success because the water was moving so fast. It was August. Uh, that same year, Stephanie. Stephanie's son died and so there was a lot of water still and it was really fast and um, they couldn't didn't find him the first night because it was too dark and even the second day they didn't really find him until later they had um, somebody in a helicopter I think spotted something and they sent the dive team out and found him but we never they recommended we didn't see his body since he had been in the water overnight and I didn't want that image to be the last image of him in my head so um we didn't see him and that was that was pretty much it so my last memory of him was <laughs> kicking him out of the house <laughs> and we tried to stay in that house um 
his next, so the second year anniversary, we um, took pictures with his uh, maple tree that we grew from a seed after he died. We, that was the second year we took pictures with it by the creek. And then soon after that is when we decided to move. So we made it about two years, <laughs> still living at the mm-hmm. house, but just being outside and knowing the creek was over there, it's always hard. I know you've come over and played in the backyard and it's, I think it's just kind of like an elephant in the room, you know, like, oh, that's where it happened. Yeah. And every time I drove home, you know, I'd pass the creek right before turning into the driveway and like, there's no way around it. It's always there. And so that stinking creek haunts me. <laughs> it seems like yeah. it's kind of strange, but my sister lived in Cuna. And um, there's a creek out there. You probably know it. It's called Mason Creek. Creek. I didn't know it even existed until after Mason died. And it just kept on popping up everywhere. And now I know that it runs all the way through to Nampa. Now on this side of town where I live, there's a whole like shopping area that's called like Mason Creek RV and shopping center and all this stuff. It's like Mason and Creek is is always together. (laughs) And uh, there's just so many things like that that are like subtle slaps in the face, but sometimes it makes me smile because <laughs> yeah. I see his name. So it's definitely yeah. bittersweet. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I have a photo bomber here if you can see him. <laughs> hey, birthday um, boy. He's supposed to be in bed, but apparently he's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but fast forward to today. We're still kind of freaks about water, aren't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's something we kind of wanted to touch. Just, you know, here we are um, going on four years now. And we <laughs> get crazy about water. We are the moms that, you know, we can't be around water with other children sometimes so I I can I'm at a point where I can walk the green belt now um Oof, where I live, there's a green belt on the river or on the creek and I can walk it now but I get so much anxiety seeing other moms with their kids and their kids playing in the water and moms <laughs> on her phone or um just not paying any attention to her babies that are playing in the water it freaks me out and I want to yeah. yell and scream and say take care of your babies I can't do it for you you know mm-hmm. um and so I try to avoid it when I know that there's going to be people playing in the water because I can't handle the news of another child dying in the river I can't do it it hurts <laughs> we had um a missing child last year last summer um in our community and I saw the community come together and look for this little boy, but I, I knew, I know I, I did knew where he was, and I couldn't handle it. It broke my heart. <laughs> um, but that's why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we're sharing our stories. Um, we're sharing that we're still here despite the heartbreak and our experiences, and we are trying to, in our pain, share hope and joy. Yeah, so if you're listening to this and you want to, you feel like you'd be helpful in your journey to share some of your story, we would love to hear it. Um, you can send us a private message or you know, on Instagram or Facebook, or if you want to comment somewhere publicly so other people can hear it, we're open to that as well. So just know that we are here with you. You're not alone on this journey. And <laughs> yeah all right well thank you guys for bearing with us and we will talk to you soon yeah all right take care